If you have your Bibles, open up to John chapter 16, John chapter 16, I mean verses 5 through 33 this morning. If you don't have your own copy of God's Word, open up to page 1244 in the Pew Bible in front of you, 1244 in the Pew Bible. As you're opening up there, as I've mentioned, uh, we are talking about joy this morning. We, we've seen already, though, a, a beautiful uh, illustration of the joy of the Lord. Uh, really, we've, we've seen um, a verse from Malachi chapter 4 uh, represented to us today. Uh, the prophet Malachi tells us that you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. And there those children went to first kids worship. I don't think I've seen a better picture of the joy of the Lord than Finn Haney in full stride there. Uh, like a young Eric Little, when I run to children's church, I feel his pleasure. You could just see the joy in his, in his face as he ran there this morning. What a beautiful picture that is of God's blessings and God's promises as we see those children running, running, longing to hear. I mean, I I'm going to spiritualize a little bit here. Just longing to hear the word of God. Why don't we run to church like that every morning, you know? It could be the popcorn, though. I don't know. I don't know. If you have your Bibles open, it's a long passage, so if you need to sit, that's okay. But if you have your Bibles open, why don't you stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the words of our God. Now, we've been saying verse 5, but there at the very beginning of verse 5, we've got verse 4b uh, that we'll read this morning. Listen to what the, what the Apostle John says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's writing here in such a way that as the words on this page are being read, God himself is speaking to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. And then verse 5, but now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father. And you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for He will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that He will take what is mine and declare it you a little while verse 16 and you will see me no longer and again a little while and you will see me so some of his disciples said to one another what is this that he says to us a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me and because I'm going to the father so they were saying what does he mean by a little while we do not know what he is talking about Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth... She has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. And your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I've said these things to you in figures of speech. And the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. 
In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah! Now you are speaking plainly and not using these figurative speech, this figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone yet I am not alone for the father is with me I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace in the world you will have tribulation but take heart I have overcome the world let's pray together O oh Lord our God would you open our hearts and minds this morning to receive your word with joy and be changed by it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. One day, and this happens often, but one day in particular, my wife Whitney and I were riding down uh, Highway 280 or Red Mountain Expressway through downtown Birmingham. And as we came through Birmingham, we looked over and we saw St. Vincent's Hospital. Our youngest, our oldest child, Emma Watts, was born at uh, Baptist East in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, some hospital in Louisville, Kentucky, can't remember anymore. But both of our sons were born here in Alabama. Baptist East just didn't sound right, but surely she was born at a Baptist hospital, right? If there was the option, it's certainly the one I chose. <sighs> at any rate, we were riding by St. Vincent's Hospital there in Birmingham where our two sons were born. Ford and Jim were both born there, St. Vincent's, and Whitney looked at me and said, I just get this feeling in my stomach every time we ride by St. Vincent's Hospital. And I said, I bet you do. Great day. I was there. I can't imagine, you know, I can't, I can't, I, 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 it's like a nightmare to me thinking about all the things you went through that day, uh, those two days as you gave birth to those children. I, 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 I was exhausted in the day just from pacing and being nervous and worrying. I can't imagine uh, how you felt. You notice, ladies, I'm doing all I can to make sure that it's clear that she had the worst day. I don't, I don't, I don't want to get comments later. I just want to make it as abundantly clear. I, I agree. You were all right. She had it worse, okay? She said, no, no, that's not what I mean, though. I get the best feeling in the world when I think about the fact that we brought babies home from this place. What a joy those days are to me. I think it's precisely the sort of thing that Jesus is talking about here in this passage when he talks about the joy that he will provide for his people. The joy that he will provide for his people. While certainly there will be sorrow and certainly there will be difficulties and certainly there are hard days and certainly there is labor involved in the birth of a child, Jesus says that the sorrow and anguish is forgotten over the joy of a human being being born. You know, oftentimes we present to the world a sort of saccharine, sweet, sort of superficial understanding of what it means to be joyful as Christians. I oftentimes talk about, call, call that REM theology, that we're just supposed to be shiny, happy people holding hands. But that's not what the Bible talks about when the Bible talks about joy. Joy, we all understand, can be a funny thing. Joy doesn't always make sense. Joy often defies the odds. Joy is something that at the surface is oftentimes incomprehensible. Even for me as a pastor, I've seen many of you suffer. It's my least favorite and favorite part of my job is walking with God's people through trials, praying for them, loving them. I hate it because I hate to watch people I love and people the Lord loves walk through trials, but I love it because I've seen the joy in so many of your faces, in so many of your lives, in my six years I've gotten to spend among you. I've seen the joy in your hearts, I've seen the joy in your eyes, I've seen it in your faces, I've seen it in your lives. 
when there ought not to be joy there, according to the world. Last week, we talked about the hatred of the world. And this week, though, we talk about the joy of the Lord. And don't for a moment think, don't for a moment think or believe that the two are not connected. Jesus is here preparing his disciples for being joyful in the midst of the hatred of the world. He's preparing his disciples to be joyful in the midst of trials and tribulations and sufferings. The very disciple who wrote this book would one, be, one day be exiled to Patmos. He's preparing these people. These men who have walked so intimately and so closely with him. He's preparing them for joy in the midst of the hatred of the world, in the midst of trials, in the midst of tribulations. And my hope and my prayer is that this text that Jesus has left for us today, I think he's referring to the Bible some in these passages where he talks about how he'll reveal perfectly about the Father later. I think he's referring to what he'll do through the Holy Spirit and inspiring the New Testament and sharing with the disciples on the Emmaus Road. I, I think we have a record then of, of what Jesus wanted us to know about himself and about the Spirit, about God the Father. This morning, I hope this passage will do the same thing for all of us in this room, myself included. I pray that it will prepare us to be joyful in the midst of difficulty. Because brothers and sisters, that's the only joy we will know in this life. None of us are going to make it out of this place, out of this world untouched and unscathed. But God promises us joy. Though, the psalmist said, the weeping may last for the night, his joy comes with the morning. Three foundations for Christian joy. Three foundations for the joy of the believer. Here's the first one, first point this morning. Our joy is rooted in the gospel. Our joy is rooted in the gospel. Look with me. We're going to skip ahead a little bit. Jesus is giving some material about the Holy Spirit. We're not skipping over the Holy Spirit, but, but we've dealt with what Jesus has said here a lot in some previous passages. And while we'll allude to these early verses before 16 later on in the sermon, I really want to focus in here on these sections on joy because I think they all fit together. I, I, think, I think this is leading up to this section on joy. So look with me really quickly at verse 16. A little while... And you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see me. Back in these earlier verses, 5 through 15, Jesus alluded to the same idea that he's going away from them. He's trying to help them see and understand the gospel. Jesus is sharing the gospel, I think, with the disciples. He's trying to help them understand and know that he is about to go to the Father. He is about to die. Now this is incomprehensible for them i'm about to go away he says look with me at what he says in verse 20 truly truly i say to you you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice you will be sorrowful but your sorrow will turn into joy now understand what these disciples have done to follow jesus they've abandoned a lot They've abandoned their careers, it seems, by this point. In fact, what else do you do? Once Jesus dies, they go back to their careers. Jesus finds them fishing. I, I get the idea they had, they had left behind all these things to follow Jesus. So they, they, they've, they've left behind. They've left behind their families, it seems. They've left behind so much of their lives to follow Jesus. And it's beginning to become clear to them exactly who Jesus is, that he was sent from God and that he's there to save them. And so imagine the feeling they would have when their best friend, their leader, their boss, the head of this family that they've developed here, their pastor, their Sunday school teacher, everything to them in one man, died the dream is snuffed out all the things that they'd given up 
seemed foolish to give up now that this man is dead. They would be sorrowful. It would be a very unjoyful, it would be an anti-joy experience. And Jesus recognizes that and knows that that's happening. But at the same time, they would also be reckoning with the fact that that the world had had victory over them and over Jesus. It would seem like the world was victorious. But Jesus says, in a little while you will see me no longer. But again, he says, in a little while, and you will see me. He says, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will what? Your sorrow, verse 20, will turn into joy. Jesus is not just talking to them about his death. He's also talking to them about his resurrection, about the fact that he will raise from the dead. This sorrow won't last forever. We know the end of the story. They wouldn't see him. He would be dead. And then they would see him. He'd be resurrected in a new life. Brothers and sisters, this is the primary foundation of joy for a Christian. This is the primary foundation of joy for a Christian. I know this sounds simple. I know this is rudimentary. But I I, I want you to know that this is the most important thing you can think on. Now, you'll notice the disciples are a little bit obtuse, it seems, at times. Jesus is over and over and over again trying to help them see, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again. And over and over and over again, they just don't hear it. They just miss it. They just don't get it. And brothers and sisters, the same temptation is there for every single one of us in this room to constantly look for God's reassurance, to constantly look for God's blessings, to constantly look for God's uh, favor on us, to constantly look for God's joy anywhere and everywhere but the gospel. Anywhere and everywhere for the gospel. We so often want to skirt around this. We so often want to miss this. We're so often like Peter and think it's something we need to fight for, something we need to strive for. But when G- what Jesus says is that the root of our joy, what Jesus is teaching his disciples, is that the way that our sorrow gets turned to joy is through his death and his resurrection. You see, we must recognize that there's no evil in the world that's greater than the evil that was committed against Jesus Christ. There's no sorrow in the world that's greater than the sorrow of the fact that sinners crucified God the Son. There's no injustice in the world that's greater than the injustice that was committed against Jesus Himself. There's no trouble in the world that's greater than the trouble that our Lord Jesus Christ experienced as he was crucified, as he experienced and suffered the wrath of God, the scorn and hate of man, the one innocent man that ever lived was crucified and suffered God's wrath on our behalf. Oh, but brothers and sisters, the Bible teaches us that we are in Christ. Therefore, we have died with Jesus. Therefore, the worst thing that could have ever happened in the world has already happened to us in Christ. He suffered God's wrath on our behalf. Therefore, now, the scariest thing in the universe is God. God loves you. God cares about you. And he raised his son up from the dead. And so, whatever circumstance we may find ourselves in, we recognize Jesus has been through worse. And he came out on the other side okay. And he promises us that same future. We then are a gospel-centered people for precisely that reason. Because the basis of all of our joy is the death of and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. That is who we are. Not just figuratively, but literally. We are one with Christ. We share an identity with Christ. You call God Father. We call God Abba because our brother Jesus taught us to. We find joy in our suffering. Because our brother Jesus taught us to. And here's what we must recognize. Is not only 
do we see then the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the gospel? But we also see what Jesus teaches us in verses 5 through 15, that he had to go away so that he could send the Holy Spirit to sustain us and to give us knowledge and to provide us with the scriptures to inspire the Bible. And so we recognize then that the gospel also leads to the work of the Spirit in our lives. And Christian joy is impossible without the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the reason why Pharisees and legalists, Pharisees and legalists are so often neat and tidy on the outside and devoid of joy on the inside. I told a friend the other day, I said, I've yet to see a great legalistic fundamentalist joy movement. I've just yet to see one. This hadn't happened yet because the Spirit gives us joy. The indwelling Spirit gives us joy. Second of all, not only is our joy rooted in the gospel, but second of all, our joy is rooted in hope. Our joy is rooted in hope. Now, externally, we recognize the gospel is true. We have the work of the Spirit, but I want to narrow this down a little for you and talk about hope in your own individual lives. Let's get, let's get really practical here. Let's put some, some leather on these boots and put them on the ground. Let's, let's think through these things together with our Lord Jesus Christ. Look with me in verse 21. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Our joy is rooted in hope. Brothers and sisters, as you ponder that idea, let me tell you this. Hopeful joy, hopeful joy sustains us in trials. Hopeful joy sustains us in trials. This is precisely what gets women through childbirth. I talked to my wife about this last night to make sure I was right on this. This is an experience I've never had, and I'm not here this morning to mansplain childbirth to all of you. But I think Jesus is allowed to, and I have consulted with the resident Alexander household uh, expert on childbirth, Whitney Alexander, and so, so I at least am not talking in pure ignorance here. It's my understanding it's the joy on the other side of this anguish that sustains you in such a terrible trial as childbirth. Such a difficult situation, a scary situation. When Ford was born, we had to go into an emergency quick C-section to bring him into the world. And I'm just going to tell you something right now. I was horrified. I was horrified. scary. My life feels to be hanging in the balance as this is happening. And yet, as soon as you hear the cry of that child, all is peace, all is well, you're thankful. You're thankful. Your sorrow, your fear, your difficulties turn into joy. Jesus here, I believe, is pointing us to his resurrection and also pointing us to our own resurrection. I don't believe that what Jesus is saying here is, when you go through a trial, one day I'm going to use it. So often, that's how we talk about trials, isn't it? Don't worry, God's going to use this. And a great byproduct of God's grace is that at times, He does use those trials. But so oftentimes, I talk to believers who hear that from people, and the answer then feels trite to them. Well, sure, He can use it, but goodness gracious, couldn't He use something else to help people? And so often what we say is God's going to bring something good in your life because of this. Your blessings in this life are going to outweigh your trials. We sort of teach that. I, I'm afraid sometimes, brothers and sisters, that we have given in to the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel more than we think in the American church. Because so often, anytime we're in trials, the only hope we ever talk about is immediate. It's healing. It's having a good testimony. It's receiving more blessings on the other side of this. It's having whatever we've lost restored in this life. But I want you to know something, brothers and sisters. The health, wealth, and prosperity gospel is not totally wrong. 
They just put God's blessings in the wrong place and at the wrong time. God is not necessarily promising when he gives us hope in trials that he will restore us in this life. He's not saying if we'll be faithful, just be faithful to him through a trial, then we'll receive more blessings on the other side. If we'll just sow in 1% of faithfulness during a trial, we'll get 100% of blessing on the other side of the trial. He's not saying that at all. What he's saying is this whole life may be toil and strife. This whole life may be trials. There are believers even now who will spend their entire lives Their entire lives in abject poverty. There are believers alive right now who will starve to death. There are believers right now who will have everything stripped from them and never have it restored. There will be believers in the great tribulation who starve to death because they refuse to take the mark of the beast. There have been believers throughout the history of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and faithful Israelites before who spent their whole lives destitute, the author of Hebrews says. Some were sawn in two. They were tortured. Many of them... Virtually none of them received God's blessings in this life. Even Abraham, who received these infinite, great, grand promises, died not living in the city that was promised him, but died living in a tent. Our joy is not rooted in being blessed in this life. Our joy is rooting, rooted in knowing that Jesus is raising us one day to a new life. Hopeful joy. Hopeful joy is necessary for this life. Hoping in Christ in the future. But also, hopeful joy is impossible to steal. Nobody can take your joy from you. If you have that hope in the future, in heaven, in Christ's kingdom, nobody can take that joy from you. In verses 23 and 24, hopeful joy is given by the Father. Have you asked God for joy? Our joy is rooted in the gospel. Our joy is rooted in hope. And finally this morning, our joy is rooted in Christ's victory. Our joy is rooted in Christ's victory. Victory. I, I, I just, we don't have time to look at all these verses 25 through 33, but I really want to focus in. I really want to focus in on verse 33. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. Jesus just said he came into the world and now he's leaving the world. He says, In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have come overcome the world. I hate cancer. But I'm thankful that Jesus does too. And one day he'll step on its neck, cast it into the abyss forever. I hate the fact that little babies come into the world and die. But I praise God for the fact that Jesus does too. I hate the fact that we live in a world in which people want to mail bombs to people or people want to kick down doors of synagogues and shoot people or kick down doors of churches and shoot people or go into movie theaters and shoot people or go out anywhere in public and shoot people and kill people and murder. I hate the fact that we live in a world where war is, has become a necessary evil in so many ways. I hate the fact that we live in a world where we need hospitals and we need health care and that there are people who are starving, that there's not enough for everybody it so often seems. I hate that we live in a world with poverty. I hate the fact that we live in a world where injustice seems to rule the day so often. I hate those facts, but praise be to God, Jesus does too. And though we may have to wait, and though in this world we may have tribulation, Jesus says it so plainly, Jesus says it so clearly, Jesus says it so beautifully, I have overcome the world. They may hate you, they may kill you, they may mock you. They hated me too. They mocked me too. They killed me too. And they threw their best at the Son of God. And guess what? No matter what happened to him, no matter what he went through, he burst forth from the grave in newness of life so that we too can have hope in him. Our joy as Christians is rooted in the fact that Jesus has overcome the world. It would be so easy. It would be so easy for us believers 
to walk around moping all the time. Now, y'all know me. I'm not much of a moper. But it'd be easy to mope. You know what I mean? I've been known to mope. I've been known to be like Jonah. Go moping off. God has to wither your gourd, you know, get you back to work. It'd be easy for us to mope, just to look around and say, you know, things are just never going to get better. Things are not good. Things are bad. There's not going to be any more Christianity. Things are terrible. Things are awful. Things are going. Our pets' heads are falling off. Everything's the worst. Be so easy, but our joy, God's not called us to mope. Our joy is rooted in Christ's victory. Jesus has overcome the world. I want to offer an invitation to you this morning. I want you to know that God has given you joy. Overwhelming joy against all odds. And my prayer is that we will be a joyful people. I want to offer an invitation today. If you have never met Jesus for the first time, he offers you his joy, his hope, his peace. Maybe not perfectly today, but perfectly one day. But if you will turn from your sins in repentance and turn to him in faith today, Jesus will save you. And second of all, you may be a believer and you may say, Pastor, I, I've not been living out Christ's joy like I should. This altar is open for you today. And finally, you may be looking for a church home. I'd love to talk to you today about what it means for you to be a member here at First Baptist Church. After this prayer, I want to invite you to come. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you for Jesus and we thank you for his gospel. And God, we pray that today you would move in our hearts and lives that we might be changed by your gospel. God, give us joy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.